My name is Alessandra Moctezuma, and I'm the gallery director, and I'm also a professor who teaches museum studies. So we exhibit the work of established and emerging artists here at the gallery, but it's also a laboratory for our museum studies class to learn about gallery installation techniques and also about museum studies. So it gets many of our students ready uh, for entry-level positions in the museums, art institutions. But this morning, I welcome you um, for this conversation talk by Professor David Avalos. He's a professor of art at Cal State San Marcos, and uh, he also is an artist himself, and he uh, teaches Chicano art. Um, Mr. Avalos was also a member of the Border Arts Workshop, and he worked with many, uh, with Richard Liu, with uh, Robert Sanchez, with Patricia Chavez, many of the artists in the 90s that were generating work that dealt with border issues. So I thought uh, he would be a wonderful person to give you a perspective on the work of James Luna and also uh, talk, uh, maybe a little bit discuss also Richard Liu. And so I will just give the floor to David. Thank you so much for coming and joining us here at Mesa. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome, Alessandra. Thank you for asking me. Um, yes, I wanted to coordinate especially with um, Patricio Chavez. So Patricio, I asked Patricio, uh, what, how did you want me to uh, frame the discussion? Uh, he said that uh, Richard Liu had come and spoken with you and he wanted me to talk about, about James. And um, um, I guess he also wanted me to, to give a context, as Alessandra uh, just noted right now. So I want to give you a context. I first met James Luna at the Centro Cultural de la Raza in Balboa Park. And it must have been, um, it must have been very late 1970s, 79, or early 80s. And we were hiring some sort of administrator. And James came by to interview for the job, we interviewed him, and he could tell that we weren't going to hire him. And he said, oh, I see what the problem is. You guys are looking for a traditional Indian. So that was my introduction uh, to uh, James, that uh, he was definitely not a traditional Indian. I don't know necessarily that we were looking for a traditional Indian, but um, we didn't hire him. Later on, we... we <laughs> We, later on, we, uh, we were introduced to James as an artist, not as an administrator, by uh, Philip Brookman, who was working at the Centro, and that would have been, I believe around 1983, we hired Philip. Philip was a man who had been a curator at uh, UC Santa Cruz, and they had had an exhibition of Chicano art called Califas, which is a Chicano way of referring to California. And he had, he and his wife had, and I forget her name, I believe it was Amy, forgive me Amy, uh, they had not only, he had not only curated the exhibition, but he and Amy then went and interviewed the artist in the exhibition, creating a video archive, and then went on to transcribe the interviews, and those interviews uh, and the transcriptions are now at the Stanford Archive. Um, and maybe that was something I didn't quite appreciate at the time, uh, an understanding of how important it is to document everything you're doing. If, uh, for those of you who are young artists, save everything. Save every document you can get your hands on. And I know you're doing a lot more documentation now with social media, you're sending stuff all over the place, but as an archivist once told me, uh, from UC Santa Barbara's library, get a hard copy of everything if you really want to keep it because who knows if the technology is going to be replaced tomorrow and there's not going to be any way to retrieve what you've got on your uh, Cyquist drive. How many of you here, here have never heard of a Cyquist drive? What? Never heard of a Cyquist drive. Yeah, it's, it's uh, how soon you forget. It was this big uh, external um, uh, 
it was the equivalent of a flash drive, but it was about this, it was about as big as my hand. Okay, and you can't you can't fit it into your computer or uh, handheld device. So Philip um, really impressed me and the director of the Centro Cultural de la Raza, Veronica Enrique, and we uh, we hired him to work on uh, to work on the 15th anniversary catalog and exhibition for the Centro Cultural and. He introduced us to James, and we gave James a solo exhibition at the Centro. Philip had gone by then, but he was our introduction to James Luna. So it's very interesting that um, in a face-to-face -face interview, James didn't uh, make the grade as far as we were concerned, but uh, through Philip Brookman, we, we came to know uh, James Luna. He had a solo exhibition. It was uh, very uh, touching, very moving. and. Uh, then we went on to, we, we actually created, we created an installation at a, at a space called Installation, and that would have been in the early 90s. He, Deborah Small, and I. And it was called California Mission Days, D-A-Z-E. And what it was, was a look at uh, the historical figure, uh, Junipero Serra. So how many of you went to uh, Serra High School here in San Diego? You did? Okay, so then, and then there's, there's the Serra Museum, and uh, he's all over the place. Okay, the missions are all over the place, Mission Valley, Mission this, Mission that. Um, you know, no doubt there's already a Mission a Medicinal uh, Cannabis Dispensary. Okay, but... Uh, what we were doing, we were looking at this, at this historical figure and we were uh, trying to get at a revisionist history of Junipero Serra. I, had been, I was working with the Committee on Chicano Rights at the time, was a member of the Committee on Chicano Rights, and uh, Rupert Costos, a American Indian, California Indian historian, had written to Herman Baca, the uh, chair of that organization, and asked him to, uh, to do whatever he could to protest the Catholic Church's <coughs> attempt to canonize, that is to make a saint, out of Junipero Serra. And uh, one of the, I don't know if, if you're familiar, but there's, it's a three-step process. So he was at one of the steps. I think he was at the second step. He, uh, and he only needed, and to get beyond that, to go to the third st step and become an absolute saint in heaven, known to be in heaven, uh, doing whatever it is saints do in heaven, um, and you know, there's you can leave that to I'll leave that to your imaginations. Um, he was one miracle away from that. The church required that someone who was going to be made a saint had to perform a documented miracle. So we put on the exhibition, and uh, James did some wonderful pieces. He had this cross that he burned, so it was just this charred cross with an arrow in it. And it referred to the fact um, that the early missions had tule roofs. So they were, they were made out of um, the same, I guess the same thing that uh, the uh, Luceno huts were made out of. Um, and the Indians revolted against them. I think maybe it was 1704. I'm not, is that too soon? Yeah, that would have been too soon. Forgive me. But anyway, pretty soon after the uh, San Diego mission, the Akala was established, the Indians revolted. Uh, they killed one of the priests and they set the museum, I mean, not the museum, uh, they set the uh, mission on fire. And so that was his way of bringing back that, that moment in history. Um, of course, you know, the, the Spaniards, uh, with their military uh, ability, were able to subdue the, the revolt and to reestablish themselves. And, Consequently, after that, the missions were roofed with tiles. So when you go through a neighborhood like Rancho Bernardo and you see all the tiled roofs, or some of these neighborhoods have a, they're required to have tile roofs. You know which ones they are? Okay. Um, that, that is, that is a, um, a cultural remnant of a moment in history when the uh, native Indians revolted. Uh, so, 
at that point, James, as, as I knew him, was, was working with this idea, what does it mean to be uh, of Indian ancestry in the United States? What does it mean to uh, be, as he calls it, half Indian and half Mexican? But since most Mexicans have a majority of indigenous blood in them, I always read that piece as half Indian and half Indian. Uh, but he saw it differently because culturally it was a very different experience for him growing up uh, with a Mexican father and then going to the res and, and growing up on, on the reservation. Since then he, he became much more of a performance artist. He was doing performance pieces back then. I wasn't working with him on, on a performance piece and, and now you see um, the works here today are artifacts that are created as a result of the performances he does. I encourage you to go to his website. How many of you have been to his website? Okay. Uh, yeah, I encourage all of you to go to his website. It, excuse me. Uh, it's pretty amazing and it gives you uh, an idea of the breadth of the work that he does. I wanted to read something from the website, his artist statement, which is very brief, but significant. Okay. In the United States, we Indians have been forced by various means to live up to the ideals of what being an Indian is to the general public. In art, it means the work looked Indian, and that look was controlled by the market. If the market said that it, my work, did not look Indian, then it did not sell. If it did not sell, then it wasn't Indian. Okay. I think somewhere in the mess, many Indian artists forgot who they were by doing work that had nothing to do with their tribe, by doing work that did not tell about their existence in the world today, and by doing work for others and not for themselves. It is my feeling that artwork in the media as a performance and installation offers an opportunity like no other for Indian people to express themselves in traditional art forms of ceremony, dance, oral traditions and contemporary thought without compromise. That's important because what he considers traditional art forms are ceremony, ritual, uh, dance, oral traditions and contemporary thought. He doesn't talk about visual art as artifacts. He talks about a lived experience and a live way of making art. Uh, Within these non-traditional spaces, and then he goes on to say, within these non-traditional spaces, one can use a variety of media such as found, made objects, sounds, video, and slides, so that there is no limit to how and what is expressed. And I think that that's a challenge for all of us. Um, how do we move forward in cobbling our lives together and slapping our lives together and, and making our lives um, Sometimes it feels to me, and, and uh, I've talked to others and they feel the same way, it says though you're moving through a dark room and you're feeling your way, you don't know exactly what's there and it's not until you get close enough to grab it, maybe smell it, taste it, whatever, that you have a sense of where you are and, and where you might be going. Uh, this play between the traditional and the innovative is very significant. Um, at one time, anthropologists felt that if you went and lived with a community and were able to record meticulously everything they did, then you understood them. Uh, I went to UCSD with, and there was a professor by the name of Beryl Bellman, and uh, he was doing a new kind of uh, research in which it was hypothesized that to really be part of a culture and you need to be recognized by the culture and you need to be recognized by introducing an innovation. That is, the people around you will embrace you as one of them not merely because you're carrying on traditions as they knew, but because you're able to introduce innovations in response to an ever-changing world that they find valuable in terms of personal and community survival. Does that make sense? Okay. 
I think since James does call himself uh, an, an Indian and a Mexican, I think Richard Liu is, is a great example of someone who also has mixed ancestry. He calls himself a, um, what is it, what is it, a Chicanese? Chicanese, <laughs> Chicano and, and Chinese. So how many of you here are of mixed ancestry? Raise your hands if you're of mixed ancestry. If, okay, raise them, raise them up high. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, you probably, uh, Fred, Fred is insisting that everybody's a mixed ancestry and he's probably right. You just have to go back. Because, because purity is a myth perpetrated within the United States as a cultural value uh, going back into the very foundations of the United States. And you go back into the foundations of the United States um, and you see it was a, a culture that identified it itself. It was the first hyphenated group in the United States were Anglo-Saxons, Anglo-Saxon. Um, and they insisted on racial purity. That's why some of the earliest laws in the colonies even before the advent, before the beginning of the United States, some of the earliest laws in the colonies were anti-miscegenation laws, laws that forbid people of one race to wed people of another race, to have offspring. It was a way of engineering how people would look in that society. Um, and early on, uh, people like James Fenimore Cooper, whose family established Coopersville, which is, you probably may know if you're baseball fans as a baseball hall of fame. But at one time, uh, Coopersville was on the frontier of the United States. And uh, James Fenimore Cooper wrote about this guy in a, in a series of novels called The Leatherstocking Novels. And he know, wrote about a guy called Natty Bumpo. All right? Kind of a goofy name. But in The Last of the Mohicans, Natty Bumpo uh, is constantly, uh, he's out there on the frontier. His uh, sidekick, uh, his tanto, is uh, Chingachgook a Mohican Indian. Uh, he's constantly reminding the reader that he is not of mixed blood. He said, I don't have a cross. I'm not a man of a cross. He doesn't have cross blood. Uh, even though he knows Indian ways and he's able to survive in the frontier as well as an Indian, he, he insists on people understanding that because in the racial hierarchy that existed in the 1900s, um, the white race was at the top uh, maybe Asians and Indians, and it was okay for, for Indians to be at the top because they were a vanishing race, right? If you wonder why they were vanishing, well, because they were being annihilated uh, by uh, Indian killers, the Indian killers that founded our country. Um, then uh, came uh, blacks, and then at the very bottom was, were people of mixed ancestry, okay? Because purity was the ideal. And so mixed ancestry was uh, Helen Hunt Jackson, who wrote the book Ramona. Any of you who live in North County know, you've heard of Ramona. The city was named after the book, a character, a fictitious character in the book, Ramona. Um, in, in that book, there's a Spanish woman who talks about these mixed races bring out the worst from both sides. Okay, so I always thought that genetics was kind of a crapshoot and you didn't know what, what was going to happen. Um, but there was an insistence in the racialized thinking of the uh, 1800s, uh, I'm sorry, not 1900s, 1800s, 19th century. There was this insistence on this hierarchy and there was an insistence that people of mixed ancestry at the very bottom. Um, it's curious because I think this country still is seized with that idea of you have to choose one or the other. You have to be one or the other. And I think a perfect example of that is our president, uh, Barack Obama. He's uh, completely out front about his mixed ancestry, his Irish mother and his African father. His father is not African American. His father is from Africa and, one of the, and from one of the indigenous uh, nations in Africa. Okay? So he's not the descendant of a slave. Think about it. He, he has, in a sense, he has more in common with uh, uh, second generation Latinos 
whose one parent might be indigenous and the other parent might be Euro-American. Okay? Um, but he chooses to identify as black. He invented himself in Chicago after being in a variety of places, being in, in Asia, uh, being in Hawaii, being in a variety of places, in a, in a variety of circumstances, he invented himself in Chicago, in Chicago as an African American. I think it would be uh, in, incredible culturally in terms of the popular imagination if instead he emphasized that like so many in the United States and so many more as we look to the future, he is of mixed ancestry. And that that means something. How do we wrap our head around it? Um, in this process of, um, of achieving purity, the, the real problem was American Indians, the indigenous population. And that uh, initial crime of dispossessing them of their land, of annihilating them, going back to the pilgrims, uh, uh, sealing uh, American Indians in, in longhouses and setting them on fire, killing men, women, and children. So many of our American heroes uh, from the um, 1800s, the cavalry and so forth, were uh, heroic in the way that they killed men, women, and children. So there's an effort to disappear indigenous people. There's an effort to wipe them from contemporary consciousness and project them only as icons, which gets us back to James Luna. And you can think in terms of um, George Catlin, who traveled with the Lewis and Clark expedition and was convinced that the Mandan people were a vanishing race because that was a story. Oh, the Indians are vanishing. Why? How? Well, the, Let's not get into that. We just know that they're vanishing. And, you know, so it's, and it, it, we should, it's, it's going to be ours from sea to, sea to shining sea. So he, he went around and he uh, painted the Mandan as a vanishing race. And then he took on their way of dressing and actually exhibited his, his paintings in places like London. He would have these huge exhibitions of his paintings, some of which now hang in, I guess it's a National Museum, or maybe the, maybe the, it might be the Smithsonian. But in one of the National Museums, uh, his paintings hang. Uh, and he would, he would arrive at these exhibitions in full indigenous regalia, as he saw fit. You know, he might mix and match and whatever. But he was there presenting this vanishing race. Um, later on, the photographer Edward Curtis went around to document, again, the vanishing race. So James is an artist who um, insists we ain't vanishing. We're here, and we're still creatively producing our identities, producing who we are from a variety of influences. So when you look at his photographs, you, you can see that uh, his sources are popular media. For example, O.J. Simpson. If you turn around here, we can look at the O.J. Simpson on the left and uh, James on the right. Okay, so O.J. Simpson was an acclaimed uh, football player at USC. He went on to uh, establish records in the National Football League, and then he was accused of uh, brutally stabbing to death, uh, slashing to death his wife, and what he presumed to be her Euro-American um, boyfriend. He went on trial and uh, was acquitted. There was then a civil suit against him. He lost in the civil suit, uh, which didn't have the uh, strict uh, uh, guidelines that a criminal murder trial would have. Uh, Americans were shocked. At, at the outcome of the trial, because everyone was convinced he was guilty. Uh, maybe the fact that he was black had something to do with that, being, being convinced. Um, but really, I felt what was on trial at that time for that jury, it wasn't, for many people on that jury, it wasn't O.J. Simpson that was on trial. It was the U.S. justice system 
that was on trial. And it's a justice system that works in tandem with the government uh, laws and so forth to criminalize African American males. Uh, so that you see the horrendous numbers uh, in, in, in prison, the horrendous numbers, the, the very high percentage of African American males that are either in prison or on probation. Um, so here you have O.J. Simpson. At one point in the trial, uh, part of the evidence were, were, were a pair of gloves that supposedly were worn by the killer. And O.J. Simpson was asked to try on the gloves and they, they didn't fit. So you see James on the right and he has a similar look. Can anyone identify what he's, what he's wearing? Gardening gloves? No, no. They might look like gardening gloves. No, they're not gardening gloves. What's that? Uh, they might be cowboy gloves. Actually, I, I see them more as uh, cavalry gauntlets. So they're the kind of gloves that cavalry uh, officers would wear. And these particular gloves are decorated with Indian beadwork. Okay? So just as O.J. Simpson is saying, hey, these gloves don't fit with his expression, what's James saying about these uh, cavalry gloves that have been decorated with Indian beadwork? They don't fit. So in, in a very subtle way, uh, he's, he's getting at um, something that uh, Richard Liu also talks about, what it means to live in a colonized body. What it means to live in a society that has subjugated you, uh, uh, disabled you, and then vanished you culturally. To the point where it, it seems like with these uh, beaded cavalry gloves that everything was hunky-dory as American military might moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. Anybody recognize that image here? It, he identifies it as a Tlingit uh, mask. It's a helmet. It's a war helmet of the uh, people of the uh, Pacific Northwest. One of the things that, that he feels, uh, in a conversation I had with him, he said, you know, he's a provocateur. He's a warrior. He's, he sees himself in battle with those who would impose upon him their expectations of how he should behave. Uh, and I think for artists in general, artists don't like to be pinned down. Artists don't like to be categorized. If an artist is invited to an exhibition that has a, a certain curatorial framework, they'll try to come up with a piece that works against that framework, but yet still complies with, uh, with the rules. Okay, so uh, we have Fred Lonadier who, was, who contacted a t-shirt manufacturer and asked them for some t-shirts uh, and said that he wanted to, to um, use them for an art project. Actually, it was a special offer. Okay, they, they contacted you? No, I found these offers on Nelson photo, photography counter. Okay. So there's a counter, there were other offers, and this was an offer by the GAF Corporation, which we knew mostly for cheap color film, uh, inexpensive slide projectors, and Viewmaster, but they are involved in a variety of things. Mm -hmm. So there's this little thing, uh, offer, to send in a photograph of any kind, a, a negative, a slide, a print, and they'll put it on a t-shirt. And so what I did, of course, was go to the library, research the GAF Corporation, and put the GAF Corporation on a t-shirt. And so, and get around their public relations, because they had a great deal to be embarrassed about, actually, like many businesses. But they, that, that's basically, in 30, Ended up with 32 shirts, starting from extra, extra small, going to extra, extra large, which was the aspirations, of course, of the GAF Corporation. Right, right. <laughs> and what were some of the, the conditions of their workers that you uh, pointed out well, the, on the, the t-shirts? The conditions of the workers were not much of an issue in that particular work. There was mm -hmm. a Fox photo piece, 
where I couldn't find out any information about that, so I just wrote an essay to have it put into the work, addressing to what might be workers, because maybe the thing's completely automated. I had no idea how it was okay, made. Okay, but what about the gaff thing? Going back to the gaff thing. What, the gaff, what, what, the, what the facts only, about gaff were you were on the T-shirt? Well, there were a lot of different things. Uh, one of the things that dealing with workers is the EPA had made it very, very difficult to, uh, in, in fact, impossible in many ways to work with asbestos. And so this asbestos mine that GAF owned was about to be closed down because they would be too expensive to keep it open. The workers would lose their jobs. So the workers bought the mine. And then they got some, uh, because of that, they got some uh, leniency with the law in relation to asbestos exposure. So at the bottom of this thing, I say, well, this is great, but then who, they own the mine, but who owns the asbestosis? <coughs> who owns the mesothelioma, yeah. which are the outcomes of right. this? Well, I don't really know the answer to that, but you know, right, that's right. a question to raise. These yeah, workers so felt caught in the, you know, caught. Okay, thank you, thank you, Fred. Welcome. So, Fred takes this offer and he uses it to subvert uh, the PR image of the company and expose um, certain contradictions within the company. Um, for example, the fact that their, their workers are exposed to asbestos uh, when, the, when the GAF chooses to close down the asbestos plant even if the workers take it over and have a job, they also more than likely have uh, severe lung damage. Uh, and those are some of the diseases as you re referred to. I think James is trying to take people's perceptions of the kind of images that blind us to contemporary um, Indian experience and uh, turn them on their head. Uh, he, he, did, he did this project uh, around the world, really, where, uh, take your picture with an Indian. With a real Indian. With a real Indian. Yeah, take your picture with a real Indian. This is something where uh, he was doing it to point out the reduction of Indians, contemporary Indians, to uh, a stereotype. Uh, there was a National Geographic magazine uh, years ago that, that showed on a, uh, on a piece on Arizona showed uh, an Indian with full Plains, Plains Indian headdress. No, no, no Indian nations in Arizona wear those Plain Indians headdresses, but he's there and for five bucks you could take a picture with him. So uh, that's the way that people, you know, people get into becoming their own stereotypes. So he's constantly working, working with that um, as a warrior, but also as a clown. On the far right, that picture where he's clowning around with a Hopi clown, he's, uh, or a doll of a Hopi clown, he's, uh, he's looking, I don't want to use the word struggle, but he's playing around with this idea of how can I uh, pay homage to tradition, how can I show my respect to tradition, uh, at the same time, uh, how can I make myself so ridiculous that people understand I'm of that tradition but not here as a stereotype for that tradition? You can see some of the other artifacts. I'd be interested in your responses to, to this series of photographs. Any of you? Yes. I was raised in Oroville. That's yeah. where... That's where the you see Ishi, people were wiped out. was found across the river in Thermalito. There was the uh, yard there where he was discovered, the last wild Indian uh, in the United States and maybe North America. And so I've always had, a, you know, kind of a personal connection. When I learned about it in college, actually right. we never heard about it in Oroville. Growing up, going to school there, Ishi never came up, but going to college and. His work, the work. How about the how about the students here? How about the students here? What's what's your reaction to these to these images? What are they all about for you? 
And if, if you've done some research to find out more about Ishii, all the better. If you just have an immediate reaction to the images, what might that be? Anybody? I'm sure those original photographs were probably taken by Americans too, you know, so it's probably like kind of a, like a laughing way of like, saying kind of like screw you for taking our photos in this crappy way even back then it was probably like a false representation of them you know and it, i'm sure that's not native you know clothing that he's wearing so he's kind of like just laughing at the whole idea of it in my mind okay so you're responding to the fuck you t-shirt yeah well all of it in general like the other t-shirt too like you see it's like a native a native american on the other shirt too but it's such an americanized shirt you know it's like yeah. this americanized version of this native american shirt you know well this she was naked so to have his picture taken, they draped him in this robe, right? Yeah. yeah. In an American type robe, though, it seems to me. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I mentioned uh, Edward Curtis, a photographer earlier, uh, and he would photograph, um, he wanted to photograph all the, the nations, all the Indian nations within the continental United States. And he would actually uh, edit very carefully what, what was seen in the photograph. For example, uh, he took a photograph of some indigenous folks inside a teepee, uh, and then he, uh, using the dark, dark room techniques that were available to him, he airbrushed out uh, a clock that was in, the, the, an alarm clock that was in the photo. Okay, so these folks lived in a teepee, maybe, but they owned an alarm clock. And they were proud of that alarm clock. But for Edward Curtis, it didn't show them as from the past. It showed them as up to the minute, if you pardon the uh, pun. Uh, so the same thing with Ishii. Ishii was, was presented, it, I mean, can you imagine for a nation that has been fed this idea about Indians being a vanishing race, in a nation that uh, they're not popular now, but at the time, uh, James Fenimore Cooper was one of the, the, the best-selling novelists in the United States and, and it had influence in Europe even. Uh, and one of his books was called The Last of the Mohicans. One of the people very much influenced by James Fenimore Cooper's novels, a guy by the name of Carl May. There's a Carl May uh, museum in Germany where they're, they love dressing up like cowboys and Indians. And in the Carl May Museum, there are actual Indian scalps, indigenous people scalps. Think about it. You can go into a museum and you can see the scalps of American Indians. So uh, indigenous people here in the United States are trying to get those uh, body parts returned, those remains returned and respectfully buried and taken care of. So, so just to wrap up, can you imagine in a nation that for generations by the early part of, of the 1900s, the early part of the 20th century, for generations had been fed this lie about a vanishing race. To be able to hold up as the last wild man, and that's what he was called in newspaper accounts, a wild man. Um, he was an object of curiosity. He was taken to the opera, and uh, newspaper journalists would, would write these accounts about how he was completely mesmerized by this female opera singer, uh, when in fact, actual accounts of what happened was he was, memorized, he was mesmerized by the si size of the crowd in the opera house. But here he is being held up as we were right all along. They did vanish. And here's the last one. Uh, when he died, those who cared for him wanted him, wanted his remains to uh, be dealt with as they understood, they were Euro-Americans, as they understood his... Uh, uh, his people to, to take care, to dispose of remains. But an autopsy was performed and his, um, I believe it's his brain, was sent um, back east. So James is identifying with him uh, and he's doing it with his own body in a very visceral way. Let me be Ishii and let me meditate on what it must have been like to have been the, um, the circus animal that he'd been turned into, the sideshow freak that he'd been turned into. And then you have a little bit of, of James uh, uh, Clown Warrior coming through with the Fuck You t-shirts, which I don't know if they're for sale in the uh, gallery store or not. Are they? I'm sure we would have made a killer with that. <laughs> no, we didn't. 
Are there things that you want me to add real quick in 25 words or less? Or Robert, are there things you want me to add in 25 words or less? Do you guys have any questions, students? I wanted, I wanted to just connect to what you said about, because I'm not sure if maybe you mentioned it, but the whole idea that is she, as an example of the objectification of the other, you know, that is ex exhibited in a museum, paraded around, and that we see in the other examples. And, and James himself actually put himself in that position. When I worked at SPARC, the Social and Public Art Resource Center in Venice, for the exhibit that we did in 1992, where most people were celebrating the discovery of America, SPARC actually put together a show that was you know, talking about all the you know, imperialism and colonization of the, and, and James came and he set himself up as an exhibit in the gallery where he kind of lay down motionless but of course he had a boom box right next to him play. but uh, but he laid himself as the exhibit so you know I feel that with this work he's kind of going back to that original you know image of the objectification of you know in this case Ishii we have a lot of other examples you know he first did that piece in San Diego at the San Diego Museum of Man right. uh, where they're, they're called vitrines, it was a display case, and it was big enough to hold him. And he put sand in it, and he laid down in it, and then he had these little uh, cards made up that would point to different parts of his body, uh, uh, burn scar resulting from falling into a campfire uh, on a night when I got very drunk, and other, other things that, that pointed to his body. So he was using his body to assault the, the, the museum goer, actually, and to, to challenge him, hey, do you realize that I'm alive? That I'm not. That 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 you know I'm a, I'm a living person and, and part of your world, uh, and not a museum display. And that, I think that was a piece that really, um, in many ways, put him on the map, nationally. That was a piece that was sponsored by Sushi, and Lin Shuti, and Lin Shuti was uh, an art entrepreneur, if you will, who was part of a network of national organizations and she brought performance artists into San Diego where people could be exposed to what was going on at the, at the top levels, at, at the highest levels throughout the country and she also introduced people from San Diego into that network. I think that that was his big breakthrough there was working with Lynn Schutte. And I think it's also, you know, how, how James has to walk a tightrope not only in terms of his tradition and his own innovation and his own insistence on being who he is uh, while remaining within the embrace of his community. But he has to walk a tightrope as an individual and a performer in art spaces. Because when you talk about Ishii being held up as a kind of um, uh, sideshow, freak show, I think it, it's the work that he does runs the danger of the audience leaving uh, entertained, but with no great insight. And I, and I think he's aware of that. I think that uh, he's altered the way that he performs over time. I think other performance artists who deal with that question of stereotypes, dismantling stereotypes, assaulting preconceived perceptions, uh, are constantly having to look at the audience response and weigh uh, what they're doing. Uh, you saw it with uh, David Chappelle. Any of you ever watched David Chappelle? Okay, so David Chappelle uh, did, did a show for many years. I think at one point, uh, cable TV offered him, what, a billion dollars or something? Wait, some, some were 50 million? 50 million? Yeah, that sounds more reasonable. Thank you. <laughs> you can see it's so abstract. <laughs> yeah. So they offered him $50 million to continue his show. His mother was a professor in an African-American studies program and she sat him down and talked with him and she said, you gotta realize what you're doing and using the N-word as much as you do and portraying us based on stereotypes that people have, you're not being, within the African-American community, you're gonna be read differently than you are in a broader community. For that broader community, people are gonna be laughing and they're gonna be saying, hey, I've got, a, I've got a license to laugh because David Chappelle has given me a license to laugh. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah. 
So that's the tightrope that anybody who works with stereotypes in that way has to, has to deal with. Um, and then I think of Gomez Peña, Coco Fusco, when they did a performance in the cage, too. Yeah. When they, you know, sort of pushing that. Where some people thought it was real and accepted it, and then some people yeah. were... Yeah, and I think it, that gets to a point where the cognoscenti can pat themselves on the back, oh, we're so enlightened, we're so evolved, we know exactly what they're getting at. But for the general public, it's like, hey, that's very entertaining. Hey, yeah. how, or offensive, uh, slap in the face. Yeah. And what about San Diego's finest tourist plantation? Yes, yes. Well, you know, at one point, uh, at one point uh, Richard and... Uh, James uh, parted ways with the Centro. And uh, in the early 1990s, the Centro Cultural de la Raza co-sponsored co, uh, an exhibition called La Frontera, the Border, with the Museum of Contemporary Art uh, in San Diego. And uh, Guillermo Gomez Peña called for a boycott of the exhibition. And James uh, informed the uh, curators of the exhibition one of whom was Patricio, that he did not want his piece, uh, half Indian, half Mexican, to be in that exhibition. Um, and Richard, uh, who also had work that was owned by the museum, informed them that he didn't want his work in that exhibition as well. And the museum uh, honored their, uh, their wishes. Um, I think uh, for, for Richard, it might have been a different motivation than James. I think. James was real clear at that time that he didn't want to be identified as a border artist, that he wanted, he wanted to, to be established in a very different way. He didn't even, um, early on, uh, he wasn't uh, too happy about being identified as an American Indian artist, even though he was all about being indigenous and, and, and recognizing his community and his traditions and so forth. He thought that that was another way of blinding people to his contemporary reality. Um, so at one time we were all uh, one happy family, but <laughs> the art racket uh, has broken apart more families than, than I can tell you about in the time I have remaining. When you have more than one person involved with something, you're going to get uh, a variety of viewpoints and a variety of stories. So what you heard today was my viewpoint. I think Robert would uh, frame it in a different way. I know Patricio would frame it in a different way. Uh, Richard uh, would frame it in a different way. Uh, so for those of you who want to go on, since you, you do have a museum program here, uh, to, to curate, you'll be doing research as curators. And you need to be really, imp uh, really scrupulous about not getting at the truth, because that's a slippery devil, but getting the story from the horse's mouth and then having people back up their memory with documentation. Because as Fred suggested early on, uh, yeah, we're all losing our memory. So, <laughs> so people will say one thing and have them back it up with documentation. Get as many viewpoints as you can that circles around events and artworks. And, that, and that's the safest thing you can do. I'll tell you, there was, I was with an artist, um, Celia Rodriguez, who painted a mural as part of the Chicano mural uh, renovation that occurred in 2011-2012. Uh, USD, the students and professor there, put a book out, a, a beautiful book with color plates of all the murals, both before and after the renovation. Um, in one place, they misspelled their name. In another place, they gave credit to a mural that, uh, that had been worked on by some people. They gave it credit to, to someone else. And I was there, it was the first time she had seen the book, and she was visibly shaken. She was really heartbroken. Uh, it, it's real, you're the ones that are telling the story, and you're the ones that need to be as all-embracing as you can. And it's tedious, difficult work. It's tedious, difficult work, but you'll be uh, uh, not enriched uh, financially, but you'll, you'll be rewarded by artists who appreciate you getting getting the story as thoroughly as possible. Well, just a, a quick comment about Richard Luz. I think uh, Richard, as someone of uh, Chinese and Mexican ancestry, is what uh, folks nowadays would call uh, an intersectional identity. 
an identity recognizing it, its multiple uh, ancestries, both physically, uh, genetically, and culturally. And rather than choosing between one and the other, you see the frijoles, the beans, and the rice. Um, you see the, uh, the chiles. How many of you like Kung Pao chicken? Yeah? The little red chilies in there, you know what they're called? Chiles de arbol. Chiles de arbol. You know where they come from? They don't come from China. They come from Mexico. The chiles come from Mexico. So, uh, you know, it, it's nice that he has the foods because I think growing up uh, in my family, food is love. If, if you went to somebody's house when I was growing up, you always went through the kitchen door. We never went through the front door of our house. We always went through the kitchen door. Uh, hey, are you hungry? Can I get you something to drink? And you, you, that was a way of sharing. That was a way of being family. That was a way of being community. That was love. Food was love. So I, I love that he has, that has them here. I'm sure that his family had nopales growing. I think one of the most significant things about, uh, about James is that he has stories from his mother's side of the family, his Mexican mother's side of the family, and his Chinese father's side of the family, he has them told to you through his children. So he's very conscientiously uh, taking this ritual of storytelling and having it pass through him across three generations. And that's, I think, a very powerful thing that he's doing. Very powerful thing that he's doing. And I think for those of you who think you don't have a mixed ancestry, you should actually start asking about your your grand, you should ask your parents about your grandparents, where they came from. Because I'll tell you, uh, we're promiscuous devils, <laughs> all of us. That both Richard and James also, in, in, in listening to them talk about their work, they also have, you know, it's their identity, yes, as, as Mexican, Chinese, uh, Indian, but also as growing up in the United States and with the culture here. Uh, in one of the stories that uh, his children tell, they talk about Thanksgiving, which is kind of, right, the most traditional American. And they say about the food in Thanksgiving includes tamales and roast pork. And so the whole combination of flavors, but, you know, celebrated within this, you know, American tradition. And then with James, you know, he has that whole series with Bill Murray and the electric guitar. And when he gave his performance, which was really wonderful on, uh, on the March 20th, he walked out of the performance singing uh, the Beatles song, When I'm 64. Because he says, yes, I, I, you know, I touch upon all you know, these issues about Indian, but at the same time, you know, he said when he was young, I think he said he wanted to be a Beatle. That's what he wanted to be. So I think it's yeah. also interesting to bring that other aspect of identity that it's also, you know, Right, he, part of his tradition is American popular culture. There's a great piece he did where he's on an exercise bicycle in front of a projection of Marlon Brando in a film called The Wild One. Okay. <laughs> I understand. I, you've never seen it. Anyway, do you even know Marlon Brando, The Godfather? Have any of you seen The Godfather? Okay, so Marlon Brando, in, his, in, his, in, this, in this film, he's running around in, in a leather jacket and a leather cap on a motorcycle. And uh, uh, James is talking, performing, as he's on this exercise bike in front of the projection of Marlon Brando on a motorcycle behind him. Um, and if you think about it, how many things have you learned to do from movies and television, from cable, from... Uh, YouTube now, I guess. How many, you know, I, I, can, I can think back to my youth. I learned how to hold a cigarette from movies, okay? Where do you learn how to kiss? Think about it. Think about it. You know, I, I, hopefully not uh, uh, music videos. Uh, <laughs> because... Videos for everything. Yeah, yeah, or, but... Um, so they're, he, they're also playing with popular culture. And, and the, you know, the desire, uh, I think uh, James came from a generation where if you're a male, you want to be a rock star. That's the ultimate achievement, to be, to be a rock star. Uh, and I think that that's something else that they're playing with, too. They're playing with, he's playing with his indigenous identity. He's playing with 
traditions that include American popular culture. He's also playing with what, me, what it means to be a man and his masculinity. And he does, he does that a lot. Um, and uh, what it means to be a man of color in this society. Um, he appears a lot with, uh, with white women, you know, or, or non, seemingly non-indigenous women. Um, and, that, and that's speaking to something, uh, like, like I say, that goes back to colonial period where people were forbidden by law from um, having interaction with Indians that would produce children. Another thing he's addressing is uh, getting older, okay? And for those of you 20-somethings, that's like impossible, <laughs> right? That's not going to happen. You can't even imagine it, right? Yeah, I've been there, you know? And you can't imagine it. But th that's something that, that he's coming to grips with as, as well. Um, and I, I think that that's really important that you pointed that out. Thank you. Thank you. That, uh, that sense of passing and what do you leave behind? As an artist, they want, uh, an artist would want to leave a body of work. Um, I forget where I heard it, but uh, you're alive as long as somebody remembers your name. And uh, I think that James impressed me early on as, someone, as an artist with great ambition. He wanted to be the greatest American Indian artist. Uh, and he arguably, he may be uh, an American living uh, Indian artist. He wanted to be in Janssen's. I don't know if anybody reads Janssen's anymore. Is he in Janssen's? Oh, the history. The history of art. A huge history of art book. Janssen's. He wanted to be. He wanted to be in the contemporary section. Is he in it? He's in it. He's in the artisan. Huh? He's in the artisan. In the artisan section. He's in the artisan section. Oh, that must have pissed him off. And you you see these you know the mixes with the guitar. Uh, and here the telephone and the uh, uh, smoking pipe made out of uh, plumbing, <coughs> plumbing pipes. Um, but this, this idea of what do, what do you leave behind and you know, can it be resolved? Can all these conflicting forces that have shaped who he is, social forces, personal forces, the particularity of the kind of colonization of indigenous people, um, the unacceptability of his work to some, all of those forces, can you resolve them at your end of your life? Can you wrap them up? I don't think so. I think uh, some things are, 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 not, are uh, incommensurable. They can be brought together. I think all we can hope for, uh, and maybe this is my, and this will be my final comment on, on James and uh, maybe Richard as well, all we can hope for is to understand that our lives are made up of irreconcilable forces, of contradictions, and that sometimes when we look within ourselves, we appear to be a mess, and we are. Uh, the question that I think, or the, and, 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 and the question is, what do you do with that mess? And I think for uh, James and for uh, Richard, it's you find a way to, to share you find a way where hopefully you'll be loved for sharing. Uh, and that's about all you can hope for because you're not going to resolve those contradictions. Thank you very much. You've been very attentive. I appreciate it. Thank you.